Good afternoon. It's one o'clock, so let's begin. And welcome to the CDC Public Health Grand Rounds. I would like to bring to your attention our new web page, where both internal, external, and anybody who wants to follow us can go and watch us live or watch all the archived sessions. I do want to point out that we have been able to get a lot of interest from a broad array of people from those very young to those very old who have followed with unbelievable interest what has been going on for the past two years. And here is the graph to prove it. We have had sessions that have had more than 15,000 people viewing us live, but much to probably everybody's surprise, the session that topped everything was done by our Geek Squad last month. It was on the electronic health records. 28,000 people watched us live, and this is our absolute record so far. I would like to use this opportunity to welcome a, a group of colleagues from Emory here today who are working on newborn uh, screening, and I had the pleasure of meeting a few of them, among them the newborn screening nurse coordinator and a few of her colleagues. And, and it's really wonderful to see uh, that this event is, is attracting colleagues um, from far and from close. So welcome, Emory colleagues. I also would like to uh, point out that CDC is getting more and more modernized and we realize that the ways of communication with people have changed. And then the younger generation, and a lot of people are younger for me now these days, and I know that's not exactly the fabulous feeling, but a lot of the younger generations are using different modes of communication. So we, as you know, are on YouTube where you can watch us, but I'm so delighted to let you know that we are tweeting today and I had to be educated because believe it or not, I'm not on Twitter, and, but I am as of today, and I know that my kids will be just delighted. It, it's a new era. So those of you, and this is the thing, I don't have any notes, but these are the notes that I had to write down because I can't say it. It says um, that I need to remind people that those who would like to participate in the tweeting process today can find us at the hashtag CDC Grand Rounds. So just want to make sure that, and this is done uh, for this session, not to say we're going to be doing it every time. We'll see how it goes. So I'd like for everybody to stay tuned for our next session, which is next month in September, traumatic brain injury. Let me say a few words about the topic today. This is actually a topic that has caused possibly the biggest level of optimism by me and those of us who have been working with our colleagues because it seems like so much has been done, a lot of progress, but it really provides a wonderful opportunities for our children and their future. And we have an outstanding cast of characters today. Dr. Rodney Howell, Sharon Terry, Dr. Carla Cuthbert, Dr. Scott Gross, and Dr. Fan Tate. And, and you will absolutely enjoy their presentation today. We did also, as always, link our presentation to the CDC action clips, and I thank some of our speakers who have helped select those topics. Now, for this session, we had a little bit of a challenge, and I would like to especially thank all of the speakers who have been more flexible than usual, and those of you who have worked with me on Grand Rounds know that the flexibility here on your part and rigidity on mine is the way to go. <laughs> And so they have been even more flexible because yours truly was on a vacation. And most people will know where Venice is. It's about 100 miles away from my summer home in Croatia. And this is my desk. I actually had a working desk in my house there. But it was really hard to focus and concentrate where this is where I was staying. And just to give you a sense of envy, this is my summer house. This is the view from my summer house. This is me on the beach. <laughs> Things to further distract me, some beautiful venues and sightseeing and spectacular food like pizza with prosciutto. So I had to designate somebody to be the slave driver 
and communicate with me. And since this is a screening session, Richard Olney was the one who actually coordinated the screening training. And as you know, we always build the teamwork. So he's the one who has worked with our colleagues and helped us get in gear. And as you see, they have had some practice in screening. You will see that each one of them has spent a certain amount of time screening. And with that, I would like to uh, set aside a couple of minutes for uh, comments from our director, who is not here with us, but has taped his comments. Every year, more than 4 million newborns in the U.S. are screened for hearing loss and selected genetic and endocrine disorders. Screening of most newborn blood samples is done with state public health labs. Hearing screening, on the other hand, is typically done by individual hospitals and monitored by public health agencies. Before early identification and treatment, disorders now identified by newborn blood screening were frequently associated with lifelong disabilities or even death in childhood. In the past decade, the number of disorders identified by newborn blood screening has increased and screening has become more standardized. Now, more than 95% of newborns are screened for hearing loss and 5,000 were diagnosed last year. More than 6,000 were confirmed with other disorders on the standard panel. This leads to lives saved, prevention of disability, and reduction of health care costs and long-term disability. But there are still big challenges. How do we balance limited resources with a push for additional screening? How do we reduce costs through automation and other techniques? How do we ensure that we not only screen but also follow up? How do we best educate the public and healthcare providers and state officials about what's working and what needs to be improved? How do we continue to develop evidence-based screening and treatment strategies and rigorously evaluate program outcomes? This session will address these and other challenges and discuss ways forward through better partnerships to ensure healthier children through newborn screening. Thank you very much, Tanya. I think that uh, next year we should have this meeting in Croatia, so we'll expect you to host that. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you today to briefly discuss the current situation with newborn screening, uh, starting from the very beginning. I like to think of the science of newborn screening that began early in the 1900s uh, with the keen interest in the biochemistry of the body. Uh, the term inborn airs metabolism was introduced by Garrod. Uh, and based on those uh, data, newborn screening has developed. Newborn screening initially uh, has focused on conditions that adversely affect the central nervous system, and as we've expanded, as I will discuss later, we now screen for conditions in the immune and cardiac system, and again, the spread of these conditions has been available technology, better understanding, and new diagnostic technologies. Newborn screening began in the 1960s and is now carried out in all states. Importantly, newborn screening is, in all situations, a public health program under the aegis of the state health departments. The initial test was for PKU, or phenylketonuria. Uh, in these early tests, it was simple, reliable screening tests and very proven treatment. The expansion was on a state-by-state -state basis. And the challenge that that developed uh, was extraordinary variation from state to state and very little systematic evaluation or the rationale for the outcomes of screening. Let me remind you at the outset that we screen currently slightly over 4 million infants a year and currently well over 30 conditions each, making newborn screening by far the most commonly performed genetic testing currently in the United States. Uh, the abnormalities that existed from state to state became of great public interest, and Sharon Terry is going to give you some specific examples of that as we move along. In 2001, Maternal and Child Health awarded a contract to the American College of Medical Genetics to develop a system uh, with scientific and medical information uh, to help identify and make recommendations based on the evidence for newborn screening. This was a large group of over 70 folks, and they reviewed independent newborn screening uh, results, and then there was an external review group that looked at their data. Uh, they published a, a, a pamphlet entitled Toward a Newborn Screening Uniform Panel in 2006, and that is commonly called the Uniform Panel today. 
the selection criterion of the UNESCO Ukrainian panel, they were, the criteria were much as expected from the history. They were in three groups, uh, the incidents and so forth, the condition, the test characteristic, and the treatment and its long-term follow-up. On that core panel recommended by the American College of Medical Genetics, there were 29 conditions identified. All resulted in serious medical complications such as developmental delay and or death if not recognized, and all children with these conditions benefit from early diagnosis and treatment. On this uniform panel of 29 conditions, 20 are identified by sophisticated technology, tandem mass spectroscopy, amino acids, fatty acids, and organic acid abnormalities. Three hemoglobinopathies and six other conditions that are listed there, and you'll hear a bit more about those conditions later. In addition, while you're in the process of identifying those core conditions, particularly with tandem mass spectroscopy, you see other compounds that are present, and sometimes those are present in abnormal amounts. Those have been called the secondary targets. You need to identify those and quantitate them in order to reliably diagnose the core panel, but in view of the fact that these are abnormal, it was recommended by this group and continues to be recommended that they be reported. Let me comment briefly about the burden of the core panel. All the conditions are rare. Uh, however, you've heard uh, uh, Dr. Frieden commented about hearing loss, which is 5,000 cases per year, and those go down to MCAD deficiency of 239 in biotinidase, uh, which we diagnose uh, about 65 cases a year in the United States. But there are 12,500 infants that are diagnosed with these conditions uh, each year with a newborn screening panel. Let me point out about the burden. All untreated persons with these conditions suffer enormous burdens. PKU, our classic condition, if you have no treatment and are not diagnosed early, you have profound intellectual disability with average IQs that are under 20. Identified and treated persons with PKU end up with a normal IQ. And again, people with MCAD deficiency or medium chain ACL coadrenalinase deficiency uh, they are at risk substantially of having sudden infant death. In 2000, uh, uh, in the Children's Health Act of 2000, the Public Health Service Act required that there be established an advisory committee on irreparable disorders in newborns and children, and that group was formulated and met for the first time in 2004. That four-year period is rather speedy at times for the government, uh, and we would like to think that perhaps they were just careful in selecting people. Broad charge for this committee, but the, uh, the, to date, the efforts have really focused on uh, newborn screening. The committee originally uh, focused on the, uh, AC, the ACMG report and unanimously accepted this report and made this recommendation to the Secretary of HHS. And in time, the Secretary of HHS has accepted this committee recommendation and designated the uniform screening panel as a national standard, which you think is very important for newborn screening. Newborn screening, uh, as far as uh, consistency from state to state, has changed dramatically from the time that uh, ACMG report was published to the work of the committee, and you can see that many states were screening for just a few conditions, and by the end of December, most states were screening for the core conditions, and about 98% of the babies in the country are currently screened for basically all of the recommended uh, panels. Uh, the committee, the uh, advisory committee, uh, has developed a very clear uh, pattern for uh, identifying or recommending conditions for the panel. Uh, this uh, nomination form is very brief. It describes the condition, the screening test, it, the treatment, and then obviously references. Uh, this, uh, there's, uh, there's a rigorous process in place for deciding about these once this nomination comes to the committee. The committee has, reviewed nine, has received nine nominations since 2007. Six were sent back for additional information or additional review. Uh, uh, four have been sent back to the nominators for additional information so they could be renominated. Two conditions have been uh, uh, recommended by the committee for addition to the panel. Uh, the first one recommended was severe combined immune deficiency, SCID. That would make the 
the overall panel now have 30 recommended conditions in the core panel. And recently, the committee recommended to the secretary critical cyanotic congenital heart disease, and that's still under review. Uh, some of the challenges as we go forth in newborn screening, there's a serious shortage of clinical experts in the area of inborn airs metabolism. Uh, there are efforts now by the ACMG to fund fellowships in this area. Public health laboratories, as you know, are stretched financially at a time when important new discoveries are being brought uh, uh, aboard. Uh, but new technologies and so forth, uh, automation and so forth, hopefully, uh, will permit the state labs to uh, move forward. There's a tremendous lack of public education and understanding. Uh, the Genetic Alliance has an important new project uh, that should provide a great opportunity for public education. The retention and use of residual dried blood spots has been an extremely interesting and contentious issue. But again, the committee uh, has worked very aggressively uh, for a long time to come up with specific recommendations about how indeed uh, these residual spots should be stored and utilized. Uh, I would like to now introduce our next speaker, who's Dr. Sh uh, who is Ms. Sharon Terry, who's president and CEO of the Genetic Alliance. Sharon? Thanks very much. I'm Sharon Terry from Genetic Alliance. I'm also the mother of two children with a genetic disorder. I want to talk to you about what's at stake in newborn screening from the parent perspective. For example, Virginia mother Jana Monaco gave birth to her son, uh, Stephen, in 1997 at a Virginia hospital. At that point, Virginia only screened for nine conditions. Stephen had a relatively wonderful first three years of life and in 2001 went into metabolic crisis, resulting in severe disabilities. He was diagnosed with isovaleric acidemia, IVA, and is treated by a special diet and medication. And if it's begun soon, uh, the child is, is relatively OK. Uh, and as Dr. Howell said, there was disparity between states. And if he had been born just a short distance away, that would not have happened for him. Jana Monaco has been quite the wonderful hero in this story. Uh, she then gave birth in 2003 to her son, her daughter, Carolyn. And Carolyn was screened before birth. And Carolyn is a normal, happy child. Jana became an advocate, as so many people do who are in these situations. And in 2006, Virginia did add IVA and some other diseases to its panel. Women and men like uh, Jana are amazing and able to do phenomenal things. The diagnostic odyssey for parents is really difficult. At birth, every parent's looking just to see, are there 10 toes and 10 fingers? And what happens to the parents of these children who go into the crisis is a, a feeling that there's something really wrong. I had a gut feeling something wasn't right. There's lots of communication with uh, the providers saying this baby is sick, it doesn't smile, there's anxiety, there's fear, many trips to the hospital. And the diagnosis is often made too late. And the most painful part is this really could be prevented. These families really help shape the system. And as in the case of Jana, become newborn screening advocates often the night their child dies or when they go into crisis. And historically, we've seen the introduction of newborn screening at the state level dependent, dependent on the advocacy of these parents. And they were very in incremental in the passage of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act and the Children's Health Act. Other key community partners are national advisory groups and advocacy groups like Genetic Alliance and federally and state funded programs, for example, the Title V programs and the early hearing detection and intervention programs. Genetic Alliance, the organization I'm with, represents the consumer perspective on the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Heritable Disorders for Newborns and Children. And we give a voice for family perspective. And we also work to give technical assistance to groups that are put, filling out those nomination forms that Dr. Howell showed you. In 2009, Genetic Alliance and our partners were awarded a cooperative agreement to create the Newborn Screening Clearinghouse. This will be called Baby's First Test, and somewhere in September, we're not going to be as delayed as the government, but we will be a little past September 1st, uh, we will be launching Baby's First Test, and you can visit babiesfirsttest.org. It's not enough to screen, however, uh, and we heard Dr. Frieden say that as well. Follow-up and management are key to keeping the promise of newborn screening. Long-term follow-up activities within public health programs presently lack coordination and have been a low priority for funding. The challenges that pa the patients and families uh, include connecting with new specialists and care providers in the face of the new disease and transitioning from pediatric to adult care services is also difficult. We have a consumer task force on newborn screening and we've created a statement on long-term care follow-up 
And we're looking at understanding that consumers really can be involved in this and provide comments and give some key messages, such as the balance that's needed between parents' responsibility to be advocates and how they cope with the disease and increased federal investment in long-term care follow-up is needed. So in summary, newborn screening prevents these diagnostic odysseys that are quite expensive for the medical system and very, very painful for families. The variability in state screening panels has a significant negative impact in families, and we're seeing that change, but it needs to change more quickly. Family advocates help shape these state screen panels and are integral to raising awareness and even funding. Consumers should be engaged in policy and program development, and it's certainly not enough to simply screen. To keep the promise of newborn screening, we have to follow up. Our next speaker is Carla Cuthbert. Good afternoon. I'm Carla Cuthbert, and I will be focusing on the laboratory aspects of newborn screening. Now, one of the vital components of the newborn screening system is the laboratory. And while the lab's most notable responsibility is to ensure high-quality population screening of mandated tests, it is always actively engaged in the communication of results and information with other parts of the newborn screening system. It plays a very important role in the translational research necessary in the design of new screening tests, and, it's and it is very committed to continuous quality improvement. While most newborn screening testing in the United States is done in state public health laboratories, other testing models do exist. For example, some states may choose to collaborate with other states in a regionalization model. So Oregon State Laboratory performs newborn testing for itself and five other state laboratories in addition to birthing facilities as noted on this slide. States may also use contract laboratories so California contracts newborn screening testing to seven contract laboratories within the state. Perkin Elmer Genetics screens for three states and the District of Columbia. And the Minnesota State Laboratory contracts with the Mayo Clinic to perform selected tests. But even though the testing component is performed by a regional or a contract laboratory, other functions of the newborn screening program remain the responsibility of the state program. Regardless of the testing model, all state laboratories are under the regulatory oversight of the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, or CLIA. Each laboratory is responsible for selecting and successfully performing testing methods for each of the lab mandated conditions. Here is a list of laboratory technologies that are used to detect some of these disorders. And even without going into the technical details about these tests, you can appreciate the complexity of laboratory testing. The challenge here is that these laboratories must maintain the highest level of quality in their testing so that they can identify all affected newborns while minimizing false positive tests. And this is where CDC plays a very critical role. CDC assures quality of newborn screening through the Newborn Screening Quality Assurance Program by working alongside state laboratories to develop and improve screening tests. All newborn screening laboratories in the United States and over 450 international laboratories in 67 countries voluntarily participate in this program. All testing that I'm referring to is done in dried blood spots, so this does not include herring screening. And of note, this CDC program is the only program of its kind that addresses quality issues of dried blood spot measurements for all of the conditions for which newborn screening is available in the United States. Proficiency testing is a very important way to ensure that measurements made in the newborn screening laboratories are accurate. CDC provides samples that mimic the different newborn screening conditions. The labs carry out the tests and compare the results to determine their performance. Any laboratory with a false negative result is actively followed up by a CDC scientist. The, lab, the program itself provides reference materials and offers training and technical consultation to the newborn screening laboratories as needed. The Newborn Screening Quality Assurance Program has been in operation for over 30 years and strives to improve its support to participant laboratories. In 2010, an excess of 700 dried blood spots were distributed and 17 reports summarizing laboratory performance for different newborn screening conditions were generated. 
In collaboration with the Association of Public Health Laboratories, the program has also been able to coordinate over several years conferences, national meetings, technical workshops, webinars, special training, all to keep the laboratory scientists up to date on current trends and technical issues in newborn screening. You heard from Dr. Howell about severe combined immune deficiency, or SCID, one of the latest conditions to be added to the newborn screening panel after a very lengthy process. CDC has supported newborn screening for SCID for several years and has worked with the states in promoting nationwide newborn screening implementation by providing funding for the first two states to implement pilot programs for SCID and by funding pilot uh, studies in the Navajo population. CDC has also developed a novel assay that does not require DNA isolation. They, we've prepared reference materials and established a proficiency testing program for SCID, and we continue to provide training and technical support for state programs as they engage in implementation. The impact of why we do what we do is so very evident to us. To date, over one million babies have been screened for SCID in four states. 19 babies have been diagnosed with this condition. 45 babies have been identified with severe immunocompromising conditions or other severe conditions that require immediate, immediate follow-up after birth. As a result of this screening, skid incidence appears to be higher than was previously reported. And now I'd like, you to, I'd like to introduce you to beautiful little Dawson. Dawson appeared very healthy at birth and was detected by newborn screening as having skid. Dawson was able to receive a bone marrow transplant on time and is now a thriving, bubbly three-year-old boy. So, what technical challenges and considerations lie ahead for the newborn screening laboratory? I've listed a few that are actively being addressed. There are issues related to the detection of new conditions, automation, the reduction of false positives, expansion to include other disorders through new technologies. The incorporation of new technology into the newborn screening laboratory workflow is always a challenge. Ten years ago, that new technology was tandem mass spectrometry. Today, it's molecular testing. Newborn screening laboratory scientists address these challenges by pioneering research projects to develop innovative pr approaches for newborn screening platforms. They work together to share best practices, and they engage in some very spirited discussions to address quality improvement initiatives. Other challenges, of course, include funding and budgetary constraints, and, they need a, and the need to keep key stakeholders better informed. In times when all state programs are being asked to do more with less, these challenges provide the laboratories with opportunities for innovation. Innovation to become more efficient without sacrificing accuracy as they advance current capabilities of newborn screening methods and promote effectiveness of this program to the public. Our next presenter is Scott Gross. Good, af <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about the health impact and economic benefits of newborn screening and challenges to follow up. Newborn screening prevents disability and saves lives, varying with the condition. It is challenging to estimate exactly how many poor health outcomes that occur in unscreened children are, can be prevented by earlier diagnosis. First, the outcomes of unscreened children are not necessarily representative. Clinical data may over-represent severely affected children. Second, the Outcomes in screen cohorts may reflect the contributions of improvements to care that occur over time. For example, in the past, young children with sickle cell disease often died of infections, many of which are now prevented through vaccines for pneumococcal disease. We know that screening for conditions that cause disability can save money. Screening for certain other conditions, such as sickle cell disease, can save lives but do not necessarily save money. Overall, though, we believe that newborn screening saves more money than it costs. 
I'm going to focus on two conditions, the two most common, congenital hypothyroidism and congenital hearing loss. Approximately 2,000 infants in the U.S. are born each year with congenital hypothyroidism. The treatment with oral medication is very inexpensive, and IQ is normalized. In the absence of screening, some children, about one, we asked me, 160 children each year would have had intellectual disability with IQ less than 70 points. And overall, the distribution of IQ scores is shifted to the left by 20 to 25 points. Children with subclinical congenital hypothyroidism have a slighter shift, about 7 to 8 points. In 2003, the Government Accountability Office assessed the cost of the entire newborn dried blood spot screening program in the U.S. at about $120 million. Newborn screening is a bargain in the U.S. healthcare system. The cost of testing for congenital hypothyroidism alone, the laboratory cost, is about $5 per infant, or $20 million in the U.S. each year. The health impact, 160 cases of intellectual disability prevented each year, 470 other children with clinical hypothyroidism, who have a gain of IQ, a total of about 10,600 points, 540 other children with milder hypothyroidism, gaining a total of 4,300 IQ points. So the total health impact, 160 cases of serious intellectual disability prevented, more than 1,000 other children who there's prevented a lesser degree of cognitive impairment, a total of 14,900 IQ points. Think of the benefit to society of all that IQ. <laughs> so the economic benefits, each child born with intellectual disability has a lifetime cost of approximately $1.3 million, which means avoided cost each year of $195 million direct and indirect cost. Those children who do not have disability but have gained IQ points we value IQ at approximately $13,000 per IQ point in terms of lifetime increased earning potential for a total of $196 million per year. So in sum, that's a gain of almost $400 million in economic benefits, which is approximately 20 times the cost of laboratory testing for congenital hypothyroidism. But we need follow-up to ensure the benefits of screening. No states currently do systematic long-term follow-up for congenital hypothyroidism. We did an analysis of claims data. We tracked children who were diagnosed with congenital hypothyroidism and had at least one or more filled prescription for the medication and then tracked them over time to see how many continued to be treated. And after 36 to 39 months, only approximately 60% continued to receive those prescriptions. There is a gap, 60, approximately 60%. So congenital hearing loss, which is the most common disorder that can be detected in the newborn period. As we've already heard, over 5,000 infants each year are documented to have a diagnosis of hearing loss following newborn screening. We know that hearing loss can have negative effects on language development, communication, school achievement, employment, and earnings. A UK study of school-aged children who had bilateral hearing loss and had been born in either hospitals or health districts which had newborn hearing screening demonstrated better language scores, communication scores, reading scores, and lower education costs. Education costs were lower, 22% overall, equivalent to 36% of the added cost attributable to hearing loss as a result of having newborn hearing screening. I should move this back up. So the overall early hearing detection and intervention, or EDI, the 136 national goals 
All infants are screened before one month. Those who have, do, do not pass the hearing screen are referred, are tested, have a diagnostic evaluation before three months. Those who have abnormal hearing all receive early intervention services before six months. Those are the goals. The EDI system is an integrated system that includes screening by healthcare providers, the hospitals, the state EDI program, the medical home. Parents have a choice as to which communication option or intervention to follow. So what is the balance? We know that the cost of newborn hearing screening averages about $40 per infant. State and federal governments spend about $10 per infant to support the infrastructure for a total cost to society of about $200 million per year. The economic benefits. On average, a child with hearing loss has higher educational costs of $115,600. 36% reduction with screening implies $44,200 savings in cost as a result of hearing screening. Multiplied by 5,000 children is approximately $200 million per year. Thus, EDI breaks even just in terms of the direct cost. If you include the indirect cost, the gains in lifetime earnings, which could be twice as large, the benefit is substantially greater. CDC has a hearing screening and follow-up survey in which EDI programs report the numbers of infants screened and documented outcomes. In 2009, 50 states and territories reported that over 97% of all infants were screened. However, of those that did not pass a screen, 45% had no documentation of further assessment. Because many of these children may have had a diagnostic assessment that was not reported, we need better communication, better linkages between clinical care and follow-up programs to document that the appropriate follow-up has been done. There are signs of progress. Indiana has shown how improved data systems and quality improvement can lead to a dramatic reduction in the number of children who are not documented to have follow-up. In Indiana, it went from 35% in 2005 to 7% in 2009. Newborn screening is a public health success. It saves lives, prevents disability, and saves money. Nonetheless, we do need better data systems and follow-up to ensure that all children have success. And last but not least is Pan Tate. Good afternoon. As a pediatrician, you have to know how much I love these pictures. <laughs> um, I'm Fan Tate from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and it's my privilege to spend a few minutes talking with you about closing gaps and improving outcomes through long-term follow-up and partnerships. So when we think in terms of the goal to ensure the best pos possible outcomes for individuals, we really have to look at the long-term follow-up piece of this. And there are many strategies that we really need to use when we're thinking in terms of long-term follow-up. Some of them include care coordination, monitoring of the diseases, data collection, and really the establishment of evidence-based practices. Not so easy to do in all of the cases that we're talking about. So when we're thinking in terms of long-term follow-up, we're actually assessing the needs of the children and families re regarding not only the disease management and, and treatment, but we also have to look at preventive care. So that combination is critically important. Tracking of the clinical outcomes of children more effectively will improve the quality of data 
and tracking and surveillance systems, and, and that will then inform the protocols that we need to use and um, thereby inform the ultimate goal, which is better outcomes uh, for children and families. For some of the more newly um, described and less common conditions, the natural history of the diseases is not so evident, and so appropriate management may be unclear. Again, long-term follow-up will provide the data to better inform that treatment and will help with the development of care guidelines and clinical decision support. So there are many barriers to long-term follow-up, and I've listed four here. When we're talking in terms of family-centered care, um, that's a, that uh, is a whole new and important approach to care. When we're talking in terms of medical home, family-centered care and partnerships are the key to medical homes. But part of the family-centeredness means that we're really looking at the timely dissemination of understandable information understandable information. And it must include an understanding of the importance of follow-up, or we'll just hear what we've just heard from Scott with respect to hypothyroidism. The heterogeneity of conditions may really complicate appropriate treatment and follow-up. And within health systems, we actually see, sometimes see some slow adoption of data standards and nomenclature, as well as variability in the workforce. If primary care uh, providers actually have an electronic health record, and you had the big turnout talking about EHRs the last time, if they actually have EHRs, interoperability is uh, often not there. And particularly interoperability with the public health system is often lacking. And the capacity of state programs is variable. And when we're talking in terms of ownership, we're really looking at oversight as well as accountability. So the current status of long-term follow-up. As Dr. Gross has just discussed, newborn screening resources are often focused on the diagnosis and short-term follow-up due to some of the challenges that actually occur with timely confirmatory testing, both in newborn blood screening and newborn hearing screening. And one of the things that we saw at the state level when I was over newborn screening is that often uh, the infants didn't have a medical home that we could find to send the information back to. It hadn't been identified at the time of screening, so there are real problems, or there may be real problems. Here's the good news. Pediatricians actually feel that they are and should be the primary coordinators of care. Unfortunately, from a study that was from a periodic survey a couple, three years ago, only less than 48% really developed a care plan in collaboration with other healthcare professionals and agencies. That's a concern. In addition, if you look at this number, 56% 50, of state newborn screening programs reported that they really don't collect long-term follow-up data. So what are some of the gaps that we can help fill? These diseases are very complex and may be rare, and they most commonly require co-management by primary care providers and pediatric specialists. However, when we're talking about co-management, it's very difficult and usually isn't funded. Um, there has to be enhancement of communication between primary care providers and state newborn screening programs. And also, when we look at gathering uniform long-term follow-up data, it's a challenge because we're looking at varying case definitions, sparse follow-up data systems, and often state-specific data collection. So for the next few minutes, we'll consider um, some of the opportunities for partnership and improvement, at least in these five areas. So partnerships have to occur uh, at the national level, at the state level, and at the local level. National partnerships actually provide a forum for providers, for public health, and for families 
to collaborate. And when we're talking about collaboration, we're really looking at a wide variety of ways to collaborate, from data collection to education, to the laboratory services that we've heard about, clinical services, and ethics. At the state level, partnerships may be very important with chapters of different professional, or professional societies and others. And at the local level, I believe that we really have to look at establishing partnerships between newborn screening programs, Title V, and providers. So here's some good news. Um, a variety of resources and information are available to support the partnership between public health and providers. In this slide, I've listed five of them, and you've heard from one today, and that's the Genetic Alliance. So what about this coordination of care? As we've heard and as you know, these disorders are complex and they often require primary care and multiple specialists. In addition, uh, other physical therapies, they have, there have to be ongoing developmental assessments and interventions. Often we need social services involved, and then there's public and private insurance and funding. So patients um, with these complex conditions will benefit not just from a care plan, but from a very comprehensive care plan. And when we're talking with pediatricians and other providers, we're saying that this care plan should include a medical summary, an emergency treatment plan, and also a management plan. You heard me talk about co-management. So physicians and specialists must work together, and the whole team, to really co-manage the care. But what's ha what has to happen with co-management is that the roles and responsibilities have to be very clearly defined. And that needs to be made clear to all families, but I will tell you it particularly has to be made clear to the families who need to know where to go to get the help and information that they need. And there has to be timely exchange between the medical home and the subspecialty and all the other providers that, that are involved. Not easy but critically important. So there are many newborn screening initiatives that have been designed to improve quality and to develop this evidence base. The listed examples on this slide uh, really include the use of decision support tools that can be used in practice and education of primary care providers and other members of the team, and to really help the whole team identify the gaps and close those gaps for the children. There have been many learning collaboratives that have been designed to help practices and state systems close these gaps. And the, some of the learning collaboratives have really looked at enhancing the data collection. How about registries and what that actually means and then the whole issue of follow-up. I'm pleased to report that the American Academy of Pediatrics has developed policy statements and guidance documents that serve as a basis for ongoing education and quality improvement. And you see this on the slide. I've also listed three technical assistance centers for your reference, critically important as we all move forward. And finally, we have just begun the Genetics and Primary Care Institute. And that's actually a recently awarded Maternal and Child Health Bureau cooperative agreement to really look at provider knowledge and practice regarding genetic medicine and that includes newborn screening as well as follow-up. So the fifth one has to do with policy considerations. There's a need for greater attention in aligning state newborn screening program capacity with the long-term follow-up. Federal efforts have really placed an increased emphasis on standardization for long-term follow-up activities. For example, there have been interagency meetings, which of course included CDC, to develop standardized case definitions for newborn, newborn screening disorders, much like has been done for some of the infectious disease disorders too. 
CDC and other agencies have also worked with state programs and clinicians to really look at the common variables and to standardize data collection procedures so that we can all begin to look at multi-state data sets that can be used with respect to the newborn screening and disorders. And ultimately, with the increased emphasis on health information technology and electronic data transmission, federal agencies um, across the board, I think, will be promoting and facilitating the use of standardized electronic data across the United States, critically, critically important. So I love this slide. This is why we do what we do. Um, you heard from Scott, newborn screening is a public health success. It saves lives, it prevents disability, as he said, and it saves money. Just can't get much better than that. Um, however, it's critically important to avoid complacency in assuming that if a baby is screened and diagnosed, that he or she will receive the optimal care. Follow-up, long-term follow-up is challenging, but doable through training and partnerships. If newborn screening is worth doing, and it certainly is, it's worth doing well. Thank you. We have eight minutes for question and answer. If in the audience, please come to the microphone if you're in the back or if you're in the front, please tap the microphone on your table. Scott, I have a question. Okay, yes. Should I use this or the one back there? Okay. Um, you all, uh, um, thank you, this was a one, I'm Colleen Boyle from the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities here at CDC, and you all did a wonderful job in terms of, of um, uh, pre presenting newborn screening and all, it, all its uh, triumphs and all its challenges, so I really appreciate that. But you all emphasize long-term follow-up. And I guess um, since we're here from CDC in the public health perspective, I, I wanted to get your thoughts of sort of where the, uh, the uh, this might not be the right word, but the obligation of public health uh, to long-term follow-up. Where, you know, are, are we required or are we obligated in terms of the fact that we've screened every child in the country for these many conditions? Where is our obligation in terms of follow-up? Um, and how do we work collaboratively with the healthcare provider and the families in terms of assuring this? Well, I'll give it a first response and then we'll have everyone else speak. I think it has to do, Colleen, with the partnership. So we need that partnership to really look at long-term follow-up because if we have a medical home and they don't understand the need or, or the education or the pieces of that, um, they won't be able to do the long-term follow-up on their own and we have to look at the data piece of it. So unless we have public health really looking at collecting the data and the information just like we talked about, I don't think that we can move forward. And so from my perspective, from a pediatric perspective, I think it's both of our responsibilities. And how, to, how we make that work, though, um, I think we've identified a lot. We talked about a lot of those problems. I think we can if it's the partnership, but it's, it's difficult. I should refer the question back to Colleen since she is a member of the committee and she has chaired, she has chaired the committee writing the document on long-term follow-up, uh, I might add. So, uh, the, but I think that the bottom line is that, that obviously the, health, the public health department has to be very much involved with this. This is a new area for the health departments by and large. They've not done that. On the other hand, obviously the follow-up and care is usually in, within the specialized centers. So you're going to have to collaborate, as Fan has said. Uh, and, and work, but hopefully the health department will maintain records about what's happening and where they are. But obviously the, the actual care and so forth is going to be in the centers. So, Paul, Fern, Paul Fernhoff, Emory. Uh, beautiful job of really summarizing 40 years of newborn screening history for everyone. It's great. I want to ask though, um, really primarily to Dr. Howell and Ms. Terry, uh, Although there is a system for evaluating new conditions that get on, and we heard successes of 
skids and perhaps congenital heart disease and how well that's worked. There are also instances now where very well-meaning uh, parents and families go directly to the individual state legislatures um, because we do have a, 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 a laboratory test, but we don't have the other data to, to, that have gone through the clearances, all the, about long-term treatment, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in many states, and you know which ones we're talking about here, uh, a lot of infants now are being screened for other conditions that really haven't gone through the rigorous review process. I personally think these families, as I say, are very well-intentioned, but it seems that they go without the data and, and that. So what can we do to, to help them really understand the bigger process other than saying, yes, we can detect the disorder? Great question. Um, <clears throat> Genetic Alliance has, uh, in fact, spoken out about this issue on many levels around disease advocacy groups promoting a disease over another disease. And it's a very hard thing. You have kids with a disease, you really want to see the future of that disease being uh, put forward. I think what we need to do and what we do is we encourage those parents to fill out the nomination form to bring together that body of experts that they're going to need to do treatment tests, that sort of thing, and to present it. Now, some have said it takes too long. They don't get to my thing that way. Uh, I have evidence, and we all believe, we all believe the N of 1 is right uh, by our experience. Um, so getting people to understand that data really does speak is, Im is important. I think we're also in a period, though, where we're looking at a global shift, and that is there are also companies that are ready to do 1,000 tests bedside with results in 10 minutes. And, and that's not science fiction, where I, if I said that five years ago, that would be completely crazy. So I think as a public health system, we also need to think about not just the advocacy of these parents, which I think we need to deal with, but as well the, the promotion of these companies. And again, I'm not against the companies creating these technologies, but where do we put our dollars in public health to make the most impact is a very big question. And then how do we educate the public about why those decisions are good ones? Any other questions from the audience? Um, yes, Carla, this is Francis Tyrell. I'm in the tuber tuberculosis laboratory. But I just had a couple questions about the regionalization and collaboration of laboratory testing. Besides the um, examples that you gave in California, Oregon, and Minnesota, are there any others on the horizon? And what incentives are there for states to regionalize or collaborate with their newborn screening testing? Um, what other, are there any others on the horizon uh, models as far as collaboration or regionalization for laboratory testing in states with maybe small populations besides the examples that you gave? And well, what incentives are there maybe for states to regionalize their testing? Well, it's the state's decision uh, with respect to what they want to actually do. I only gave a sampling. I have actually a larger slide that actually describes all of the states that actually work with each other. So you will find that there are different states that will interact with each other. And it, it goes out on a matter of a bid. It, it depends on the state. Uh, it depends on what they have as part of their screening panel. And they have to find um, a, a corresponding state that chooses to actually do this. So it really is up to, to them to decide whether or not it's going to be more cost effective to do it internally. Some states will continue to choose to do it internally. Others will look outside to actually do either all of the tests or will do uh, a select, select panel of the test. But again, that depends on the expertise that they have in-house, uh, and it depends on their long-range plans. And it depends, again, on, on the laws that exist within uh, their own system. Let me make a, another brief comment. Uh, there, there are two things. There's the screening test and then the conf confirmation. Uh, and particularly in the confirmatory test and follow-up, I think there's really increasing cooperation through the regional collaboratives. As you know, the United States is divided into sections under hersham funded regional collaboratives. And particularly, regions are looking and saying, you know, goodness, this is a very rare confirmatory test, such as a confirmatory test for Crab A disease, for example, and are indeed trying to regionalize. And I think they're making considerable progress in that area. Thank you very much for your attendance. Do Dr. Popovich? Those of you who are here in person, thank you for coming in person. Those who are watching us live, thank you as well. And we'll see you same time, same place in four weeks. Thank you.